This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdell. I'm a writer and film critic and today I'm going to be talking to a friend of the podcast, Pamela Hutchinson. You might remember a year and a half ago she was on the podcast talking about her BFI classic for Pandora's Box. Now she has added another title to the BFI classics range and this time it is Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger's The Red Shoes, a wonderful magical film, perhaps one of the heights of British cinema. I was going to say post-war, but it was uh, it was kind of conceived during the war and, and finally uh, released in 1948. Uh, it's a wonderful book, a wonderful read, and it will do exactly what it says on the tin in the sense that it will send you back to this classic film with fresh eyes, ready to watch it once more. If you enjoy the conversation, please remember to spread your love in whichever way and mode you find satisfactory to your own person and consistent with your morals. It can be social media or it can just be word of mouth or you can even write a letter, post post a a poster up in, in your local village or walk through the streets ringing a loud bell and crying, oh ye, oh ye, writers on film, new episode has just dropped. On a, any, any of those will be acceptable to me uh, and, and uh, will probably do the job. First of all, enjoy the conversation. I've got a feeling I've become that person. I've got a feeling every time I interview someone, I'm going back to Terence Malick. (laughs) It's like, we're not talking about Terence Malick, you fool. It's like, yes, I know, but that's where my head is. So that's where I'm going. I think that I do have a capacity to relate everything back to the silent era. Just like, well, it came first. So it's always relevant. (laughs) There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get back to basics, man. Exactly. I can't be doing all this sound and colour. <laughs> it's distracting me from the main point of the red shoes, which was clearly that two people should be looking at each other in a room. Oh, there is. There, I mean, that, in a way, that's a great way of starting because you're coming out of silent cinema. And yet when you look at the red shoes, those the characteristics and I know you can I know I can sort of anticipate a little bit what you might say here, but um you're seeing a film which is absolutely fundamentally a sound film and fundamentally a colour film. Although you have a brilliant little uh, sentence, which I I just knocked me off my feet a little bit. You said, in this era, colour was still a special effect. Yeah, especially in British cinema. Um, And that's uh, one of the reasons that, spoiler alert, a lot of critics really have objected to the ending. Now, like the ending is like the rest of the film in colour and it's quite gory. I mean, it's really not gory by our standards. But the idea of using Technicolor for blood is just too much. It's a bit like when Gaspar Noé made that film using 3D because 3D is not for those intimate shots that he used it for. We think that's too much. You can't have that. You know, 3D is for, you know, people throwing balls around, not people throwing balls around. Right. So, <laughs> not in the Gaspar Noé way. <laughs> I mean, you know what? Yeah. I mean, I kept thinking about that film quite a lot with that moment. So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, in the 1940s, I'm going to do some sweeping generalizations. Like, there were a lot of people that thought the best films came from the silent era, in Britain, particularly. The best films came from the silent era. If you read Sight and Sound at that period, they keep saying, well, we don't have anything like we did then. And there's this trend in British cinema, which is about realism and the documentary movement. And somehow, that's purer than any kind of storytelling. So it's really interesting to have a film that's got fantasy and colour and music and um, particularly the fantasy elements. But what Powell and Pressburger in particular are taking from the silent era is trick cinema and magic and transformation scenes. And when Michael Powell talks about doing the ballet sequence and he says, my imagination goes back to the, the, my memory goes back to the, the first films, you know, he's, trying to get back to that period of cinema where it's an attraction it's a wow it's a look at this moment and you know often those are quite gory moments if you think about all those sort of trick films about people losing limbs and things like that but it's about you know things bursting out of the space and painting on the color and so on so 
it's interesting that I know some people think, well, Pamela writes about those dry black and white silent films. Most silent film fans I know love Pamela and Pressburger and love a musical. And it's something about maybe the exuberance of enjoying the form that connects this particular kind of nerd with that particular kind of film. Uh, and Michael Powell would love that. And certainly Pressburger would love that connection. But you come back to sort of the inspiration Pressburger had uh, in his very earliest sort of relationship with cinema being a film, one, exactly one of those magic films that you talk about, with a plant growing up into the ceiling. Um, where where did, uh, I mean, I know this because I've read your book, but uh, for our listeners, <laughs> how maybe you could talk a little bit about how Pressburger and Palfa sort of met up and started working together and became, you know, this amazing team, The Archers, which Scorsese has, so, has quite recently, um, you know, sung the praises of quite a eloquently, uh, I think, in sight and sound. Oh, yeah, and, and everywhere. I mean, Scorsese, yeah. you know, if no one else liked Powell and Pressburger, they'd be considered important just because of the amount of love and endorsement and championing advocacy that uh, Scorsese does. So, I mean, pa Michael Powell from Kent, sort of film nerd, very ambitious within the film industry, Emmerich Pressburger, Hungarian Jew, you know, moves to Berlin to have some kind of career, has to get out of Berlin because of the Nazis, moves to Paris, has to get out of Paris. I mean, his his career at this point, he's doing being successful as a screenwriter when he's in these places, but it looks hapless. You know, he's having to reinvent what he does. The idea that the most sort of ambitious, determined young man in England in the film industry and this guy who's had so many setbacks get together is it, such a sort of one in a million. And actually they inadvertently worked on the Red Shoes together before they got together in that um, Alexander Corder was trying to make this movie and he got Emmerich Pressburger to rewrite the script. They had this atrocious, uh, shouldn't be so rude, but quite atrocious script uh, for this idea that it was going to be take the Nijinsky story, but put Merle Oberon in it. And you have to be an Alexander Corder style genius to think that's going to work. So he had Emmerich Pressburger rewriting that. He had Michael Powell looking over the dancers is this because of Michael Powell's cinematic talent? Is it because of Michael Powell's interest in young women's legs? History will never be able to reveal that to us. But yeah, so so he was hiring them for various things. He put them together for specifically for the spy in black. And, you know, I was able to sort of quote Charles Barr saying the minute that the spy in black starts, this great spy thriller, it has this almost musical, comical almost composed cinema opening. And you can just see the magic of their precision filmmaking, their humor, and the sort of breadth of their humanity already here. And, you know, it was just one of those things that had to be. And it's great to see in the Red Shoes a lot of that, people recognising their perfect collaborator, because that's the exciting moment that they had too when they first started working together. It, it is it is fascinating as well, because there is this sort of dovetailing of, of opposites in a way. You know, Powell is this, in many ways, this very privileged young man who spends his time sort of, motoring around the south of France and Pressburger, as you say, is this, you know, he's this outsider who who feels that he's been shuffled from pillar to post uh, because of the hostility of the world around him. Um, and yet when they get together, those differences utterly sort of complement each other. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they they work by like handing the, the script or whatever back and forth. I was lucky enough um, in researching this book to get into the archives, you know, and to get permission, but they're, they're all there in the BFI National Archive. And you can see them going back and forth on the screenplay, but particularly on the, the novelisation that they wrote in the 1970s of the Red Shoes, which was clearly, you know, partly an idea to make some money out of their biggest hit, but also... They wanted to tell more of the story, get some of the bits right. And so they're, they're very much you know trying to get into the detail. And you have this story that is both of theirs. And that's why they have this joint credit, written, produced and directed, because it is it is a bit too reductive to say that Pressburger wrote it and Michael Powell directed it. Pressburger was there on set the whole time and he was in the final edit. And actually, actually, John... This is kind of how screenwriters, successful, important screenwriters works in the silent era, that you kept writing the film as the film was being made. So you were there to, with the intertitles in the edit. So again, he's taking that from that earlier period. Um, and of course, we know because he tells us and it's delightful the way he tells us that Michael Powell was the inspiration for so many of the moments of genius in this film and all of theirs. You can't, you know, sometimes you want to big up Emmerich because he gets a little overshadowed, but you can't take anything away from from Michael. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, the I, I love the way you you have so many jokes in this book. I, I, <laughs> I didn't realise I was writing jokes. <laughs> oh, there are so many funny lines. Oh, come on. You say that at one point um, the ballet idea has legs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's just the way my mind works. I'm like, well, how, how would you express this? Yeah, I mean, one of the things writing this book is, um, you will be aware, John, that a lot has been written on The Red Shoes and on Paula Pressburger and all of their collaborators. And I tried to put in some new things that maybe hadn't been dwelt on, but there's no way in this book that every bit of information is new. This is not downloading everything about The Red Shoes. It had to be enjoyable. It had to be a bit of a dance. I wanted people to enjoy reading this book because it made them think about the film it made them think about the film perhaps in new ways and it made them want to just go back and watch the film again you know i wanted people to have an enjoyable time with it so yeah maybe that's why there are a few uh a few lines in there that might be considered um playful <laughs> exuberant joy de vivre <laughs> yes. exuberant would be great for an exuberant film i mean can you imagine writing something on this film that was dry and just sort of downloading the information to people it would seem a travesty you know you've got to enjoy it you know if I were say writing about Terence Malick I know that I'd have to be philosophical and, and beautiful at every every point which I'm, I'm sure you've done um you know <laughs> you don't know no, no pressure no <laughs> pressure every, every every sentence would have to be a perfect aphorism contain the universe within its perfect structure I just wanted no people to have at all <laughs> you yeah well exactly and that's what you I think that's what I think you achieve and as you say you know ballet has got legs because uh, you know years later um, you know you have something like the Black Swan coming out and being utterly uh, influenced if not you know kind of an unofficial sequel to to the Red Shoes down to the title yeah I mean there's so much about the Black Swan that wouldn't have happened without the Red Shoes I mean they even they they, they mimic that famous cut where she's pirouetting and she's flashes of her point of view I know but a lot of people have done that um I don't want to put it all on the red shoes but after the red shoes the ballet film is never the same again there's a couple of other things happening there's a Ben Hecht film around the same time that's quite dark but we usher in this acceptance of ballet as a dark art as ballet as difficult as ballet is something that people do when they are perfectionists and if you think about the great ballet films you know, popular ones. You think about The Turning Point, for example, from the late 70s, which was hugely popular. It's got all the same themes and crises of The Red Shoes. And almost every ballet film after The Red Shoes has some kind of focus on the body horror of dancers' feet and the pain that they go through and how difficult it is to practice, you know. I mean, we have Suspiria, which is obviously the sort of masterpiece of ballet horror, which takes a lot aesthetically from the film. But people take these very specific themes I mean, there's the um, the company is is such a great film, but you know the the even films that are quite poppy. I've forgotten the name of it now. The one from around two thousand, really famous teen ballet film. That's got so much foot and shoe gore in it. So uh, much. No, not Billy Elliot then. No, no, not Billy Elliot though. Billy Elliot does have quite a lot of um. There's a I think there's at least one shot that's a direct reference to the red shoes. Um, when she sort of throws the shoes at his feet. And says, I dare you. I love that. I love that. But yeah, there's there's an acceptance that if you're going to talk about ballet, it's going to be hard. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that even goes to sort of something like whiplash in terms of sort of like that idea of perfectionism and what, you know, if you're going to have, if you're going to concentrate on this, you can't have a relationship, which is like at the core of both films. Yeah. And I think that it's something that people really, really um, still worry about. I mean, obviously, I mean, I was just driving back home yesterday and listening on the news to how you know women are not getting special child you know enough time off work for childcare these days but you know if you want to dedicate yourself to something that's really attractive and you know everybody well not everybody a lot of people want to work for Lermontov you know a lot of people want to do the very best they can and doing the very best you can in your work let alone your art means doing a terrible job elsewhere and we all know it we all know we have to give something up and you know I think there's always that horror story. What if you gave everything up for art and then you didn't make the art? What if you gave everything up for art and then you were sad at the end of your life? You know, there's we know there's no solution to this problem. And one thing, if there's one thing that I want people to sort of get from this book, you know, a lot of people talk about Lermontov as the perfectionist and therefore he's a model for Alexander Korda, for Michael Powell, for Pressburger, even for Nanette de Valois, who was running Saddler's Wells. 
Moira Shearer is the perfectionist, and Vicky Page too, the character she plays, but Moira Shearer is the fierce perfectionist who was never happy with anything she ever made. You know, people talk about how Moira Shearer was sometimes a bit critical of the film. Moira Shearer was critical of herself constantly. The entire art form of ballet, she's like, it's a bit narrow. Aren't there other things you could do? Well, she's literally at the top of, of, of that game. And if you're going to want to be the best, then nothing's ever going to be good enough. Well, I mean, uh, Moira Shearer is one of the more inspired decisions of Michael Powell as well, which I think there are two or three major decisions. I'll, I'll, I'll give you two, and I want to get your thoughts on this, because I think, I mean, you're giving me these two through the book. Uh, one was um, to use a, a real dancer in the lead role, Moira Shearer, and rather than a, a Merlot Baron or a, a double or Natalie Portman or whoever. Um, and the second is he wants to show a substantial piece of ballet. So both of these are sort of like, we're not going to fake it. We're going to do it. uh, We're going to actually put ballet into the film rather than a movie version of ballet. Although it will end up being a movie version of ballet because of Jack Cardiff and various tricks that are going to be used. But at the heart of it, there are going to be ballet dancers and ballet. Yeah. I mean, the thing about those two decisions is now we can look back and go, well, he was so right. But of course, that's, you know, how he always used to describe, you know, his career going out on a limb. That's the scariest thing. And the executives were very conscious. They were like, no, no one's going to come and see it unless you've got Antard, Olivia de Havilland, a star. Get Wendy Hiller in a tutu stat, you know, and and they were terrified. And they were rightly terrified because it could have been that Maura Shearer couldn't act. And in the grand scheme of Maura Shearer performances, the acting in this film, her first attempt is is not her best acting, but she's she's fine actually. She's because she's quite like the character; it works quite well. And the ballet, of course, everyone could have got bored in the same way that popularly Tales of Hoffman has stressed and irritated and tested the patience of viewers. People that people thought that people would get that bored within seventeen minutes of the ballet, and it could have it could have been bad ballet. It could have been bad film. So those great decisions that look so obviously brilliant now were why this was an expensive and stressful shoot, why the executives were calling him a megalomaniac and refusing them any more money and in the end didn't even give the film a proper release, which is just criminal. Um, They are great decisions. They also came from Emmerich. Emmerich was very keen on making that big work of art. I think he was scared of actually doing it, which is a completely normal reaction to, (laughs) to trying to put a ballet in. And, you know, it changed cinema, you know, We'd had dream ballet sequences, but this, I mean, Hollywood was green with envy when the Red Shoes came out. And the Freed unit just were like, we need to do better. We we, we need to get our crown back because the Red Shoes are stealing on and our thunder. And and they did. Um, But, you know, 17 minutes is somehow the perfect length for that ballet. (laughs) I mean, I'm so. I also was thinking while I was watching it because, of course, your book did did its intended trick. It sent me right right back to to rewatch it. Um, yes. I, you know, I'd watched it a f- couple of times previously when I got my Powell and Pressburger box box set a few years ago, nice. and um, and this and I rewatched it, and of course, that 17 minutes feels almost too short. You want it to go on. I was thinking as well, and I hope my chronology isn't off here no i don't think it is um i was thinking of those later gene kelly musicals as well as particularly the sort of the the really long musical sequence towards the end of um singing in the rain that i mean do you get those if you don't get the red shoes i mean absolutely not uh gene kelly played the ballet from the red shoes to the executives at mgm several times in order to convince them to get him to do to allow him to do the the ballet sequence in american in paris you know and that sounds great, you know, that Jane Kelly saw this and wanted to do the same thing and, and and persuaded them that it could be brilliant. There is a complete pattern with Hollywood seeing something come over from Europe that's popular and saying, well, we'll have it now. So we hire that guy and we do that thing. So um, The Red Shoes was a hit in America, you know, a huge hit, topped the box office, won Oscars. People went to see it several times. So, yeah, it, this allowed MGM basically to do those things. Yeah, the long sequence in Singing in the Rain is a really good example because people know it and because it starts as if it's going to be 
the ballet sequence from the film, from, you know, from the show that they're trying to put on or the film that they're trying to make. And it goes into this psychological thing. I mean, it's not quite as dark. And you go all the way through to the one at the end of La La Land. And to a certain extent, the ones in Barbie, I mean, I had a great time at Barbie, but I wasn't feeling the texture of the red shoes in it although they're clearly going for the same you know they're going for this dream ballet thing they're throwing back to that and I've noticed that there have been a few more kind of dream ballet sequences in cinema recently and hey that probably comes down to Terence Malick actually there's a lot there but um people are ready to have this pause this psychological and aesthetic pause and not many of them are quite as dark as the one in the red shoes which is an actual horror show. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you you bring up how horrific the original Hans Anderson uh, fairy tale on which it is based. You're chopping her shoes off, uh, chopping her feet off. Indeed. There's so much gore, and it all comes from these dark places in Hans Christian Anderson's life. You know, he had a difficult life. He had a very strange relationship to fashion, clothes, his body, sexuality. You know, uh, there's nothing about the Red Shoes original story that is charming in any way. Um, and, and it's interesting that in ballet the 30s people were reaching for this as a metaphor you know where people were enjoying this um, and that's why it gets grafted onto the Jinsky story so you have a real life bar- ballet horror the Red Shoes fairy tale and then you have every single painful anecdote from British ballet history that they can get in you know it's a bit of Diana Gould who um, was considered to be the most graceful British ballet dancer tried was hired by the ballet ruse twice but then people died and she couldn't get in and then she was just about to be great and then she married Yehudi Menuhin and you know so you know Julian Kreister Marius Gorian's character in the, in the Red Shoes he's no Menuhin no you know he's not <laughs> but you know the, and Anna Pavlova's death is in there and everything that traumatizes people you know little Vicky Page she's like posy fossil all grown up and you know if anyone wants to seriously understand the red shoes and hasn't been that child that read ballet shoes 87 times you know i don't know how you're gonna get on with it like i didn't realize i was researching when i did that as a child <laughs> i am joking obviously it's a it's a fun story for children but a lot of people who like the red shoes will have read that book as a child yeah absolutely and i mean that is a dora duncan story as well of uh, sort of almost being decapitated by her scarf i mean and you know so there's two stories about Isadora Duncan dying, you know, and there's one where she leaps into the air when she gets caught in the car and one which is less dramatic. And obviously this one goes with that, you know, Michael Powell was around in the 20s and the Riviera when that happened. He met Isadora Duncan and yet he will have taken the grander story. He'll have taken the, the you know, if Michael Powell, I mean, one of the things that's like sort of big what if of British history, what if Powell and Pressburg were at their peak and it wasn't the war? Is just imagine what films they would be making what if they were making them these days i mean they would be very grotesque horrors they'd be the most extravagantly subversive strange things you know there's so much horror in all their films bursting to get out uh, i uh, had this fun experience when i was started working on this my dad had never seen the film because you know it's for little girls um so he sat down to watch it with my mum, and he was so confident that this was a film for little girls he knew exactly how it was going to end he could not have been more disturbed by the final sequence of this film because, you know, it has been considered this, like, little girl's film, and yet it's incredibly traumatic. Yeah, it's like sort of the Black Beauty or the Red Shoes. There's this sort of dismissal of, uh, you know, anything that that's... And I'm, I'm sure that when I got that box set, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to watch Matter of Life and Death, the Colonel Blimp, and I'll leave Red Shoes till the end, you know, as a completist. And it's just like, no, that's like, this is the key film. Um, I mean, one of the most difficult questions to answer is, what's your favourite Harlan Pressburger film? And, um, you know, Matter of Life and Death, you know, it's got everything in it. I love, I know where I'm going. I'm like a small person cheering on for a small back room anytime I get the opportunity. But yeah, I know there's there's a sense that some films are more serious. Like if you're a serious Paul and Pressburger fan, it's Blimp, it's Canterbury Tale. But The Red Shoes, just because it's spectacular doesn't mean it's not as intelligent, as dark, as complex, as full of um, nuanced feelings about the war and Britishness and Europeanness and everything that could possibly make you squirm in the other films, which we love to squirm, don't we? 
Oh, absolutely. And I mean, right from the very beginning, you get this sort of, there's something vertiginous about this film. The the stairs in the, the rake of the theatres are so steep. The stairs that the students are running down to, to sort of get in and storm the Bastille and, and get into the gods. That There's this sense already of sort of imminent danger of something, even, even like, I was watching it and thinking, God, that looks like crowded. That balcony could collapse any minute, you know. Um, I- and they sort of surge in a wave, don't they? And actually the yeah. opening line of the film was at one point something like Storm the Bastille um, because they were really trying to, in the original screenplay, make more of the class difference between Julian and Vicky. And so he was very much, well, at one point he sort of describes himself more or less as a red or seeing red, um, and not quite a communist. But yeah, the were people are putting themselves in uncomfortable positions for that art constantly. Everything is very dangerous. Everything's very precarious. It's played for laughs quite often, like when Marius Goring first arrives backstage and he almost gets carried off on some sort of Greek galley and things like that. But, you know, you know there's danger. And another person that I watched it with um, while I was working on the book, I've made my lucky partner. I've made him watch so many backstage musicals. He knew where all this momentum was going. He knew it was going to the final show. And of course, it doesn't go there. It goes somewhere else. The show is not the end. And that was like the big the big shock for him was that the, the the show is in the middle because we think that we're we're building up for the great overnight success story. But the overnight success story is just where it really gets bad, you know. And in the original screenplay, there's so much more after that. We get into a lot of detail about how sad Vicky Page's life is once she leaves the ballet Lermontov. She has to live in Bayswater. Um, she says it's indescribably sordid. <laughs> But they're trying to set up a new English ballet school. There's all this going on. But we just, we really just need to see her fall. As you say, we've gone all the way up to the gods. We've got to fall. It's going to happen sooner or later. Ugh. I, I, I love the way that first scene to also sets up this idea that um, people are ta- there's a real ballet scene in England and people are taking this really seriously. And, uh, you know, you have the drama of Craster realizing that his professor has ripped him off. But the guy beside him says, hey, wait a minute, that's your score, isn't it? And and the other two, there's a guy with a beard and they're studying it. They're not watching it. They're absolutely, you know, and, and when they get up to leave, people are hissing them. And, you know, there's just such a sense that this is really important to people. And, you know, and it's interesting because there definitely was that. The word ballet domain was sort of coined in the 1930s. We had this idea that people took it terribly seriously and, Pearl and Pressburger both went to the opera and the ballet and they knew how seriously people took these things. But it's also, I mean, you and I know that they are clearly also parodying how people were about cinema. You know, that kind of, you know, you wouldn't have someone standing up in the middle of the screening and walking out, everyone would be shushing. Uh, the very same sort of, it's, it's quite gentle, weirdly, but you know, you have that kind of um, riffing on the cinephile in Peeping Tom. You know, you had sort of nerds and the, I want to discuss the new film with the Everyman, you know, very, very serious uh, and talking about sight and sound and so on. And, you know, Powell and Pressburger did read their critics, particularly Powell, and did know all about that. He had come up through reading the magazines. So it's it's film fans too. But I love the this setting up of the narrowness of it. Like some people only like dance and some people only like ballet and uh, only like music, you know. And the film doesn't actually ever say it's best to like them all together. It's best to enjoy them all together, really, is all it says. It almost still believes that you can be a specialist. (laughs) And one of the things that I found talking about music and how that was, uh, you know, already saying, okay, we're going to put a piece of ballet on the screen. It seems to me a a remarkable, audacious thing to say, and we're going to put like an original piece of music on the screen because you know wouldn't it have been safer to say let's get the best ballet music and maybe the most sort of uh recognizable and put that on the screen because we know at least it's top quality but not only did they say let's put the best you know let's put a totally new piece of music on the screen but um can you write it in a week please (laughs) i know i mean so uh they had someone writing the school they had their sort of former composer, and then they they brought in, they didn't like it. Robert Heltman said, no, it's not going to fly at Govan Garden. Uh, so they brought in Brian Easdale, and, and, you know, he did 
work on that very quickly uh, as someone who's lived quite a lot of time with the dance of the red shoes going around my head i sometimes wish she's never written it you know it's quite a stressful piece of music to listen to a lot when you're working on it uh, to a deadline um and robert heltman too was choreographing the ballet and what they were doing is they were filming six days a week and seven days a week robert heltman was choreographing the ballet which meant that anyone who danced was rehearsing with him on the seventh day so this is not optimal at all and it possibly speaks to Paul and Pressburger's ignorance about what, uh, or innocence, shall we say, naivete about what it takes to write and, and choreograph a ballet. You know, it's, there's a, there's a, all the films that never happened, they were really good friends with Wendy Toy and, and they did try and do some projects with her and that never quite happened. And she, she would know how long it would take, but they did it. And it isn't the fanciest choreography. But it is the most beautiful set, and it's the combination of the choreography, the performance, the design, and the and the cinematography that makes it a special ballet. And they never really did get to do it on stage like they planned to subsequently. But I think they would have been in a terrible bind if they'd have tried to do the Sleeping Beauty, say, um, because or Miracle of Gorbals or one of these original English ballets at the time, because it would have had so much more input from Sadler as well saying you have to do it this way and you can't not film the footwork and it has to be this performer and so on to get the freedom they needed they had to come up with their own thing so that was in many ways that was a stroke of genius really um yeah so much there's so much going on there yeah absolutely and i mean in a way earlier i said um it's you know they're just putting the ballet out there rather than cheating it but of course uh you you point out that the cameraman is sort of slowing down some of the images and and, and speeding up and and doing various things to met to and, and and he's moving the camera we're not seeing the proscenium arch uh we're not we're not supposed to be in the audience we're inside the camera yeah, I mean, it sounds a little bit, it's probably the most obvious thing to point out, but it sort of becomes some, a part of the ballet, becomes a dancer in itself. Yeah, and you you have to, you know, if you're trying to sort of think about the response to the film from the ballet community, yes, it looks beautiful. Who doesn't want to see Moira Shearer, 22 years old, just, you know, really beginning to be the great dancer she is, pirouetting, now see it in slow motion ever so slightly with falling cellophane around her. It's glorious. But it's not ballet because ballet people want to see how well the move is executed and in which style and how precisely a human body can do that in the same way that we perhaps as cinephiles enjoy the fact that a slow down bit of motion or, or perfectly placed colour can make that image so great. And so they find it so frustrating to watch and it was so frustrating to dance because it was only, you know, a few steps at a time. I mean, that's what Moira Shira says. I have to say, you look at it again, she got a few steps in in a row. It wasn't always just two seconds, but, you know, waiting around for the lights, which was so painfully hot, the hottest lights they'd ever had in the studio. They built new lights, terrible abuse of grease painted dancers, you know, and on a concrete floor. So, so yeah, you're looking at it and you're not seeing what a ballet expert would, would want to see. And it, it's a bit like someone saying, well, you know, I watched the film. Well, I watched it on a plane. Well, I didn't have my, hear my earphones in for most of it, but I watched it. You know, you or I would think, I just haven't seen it. And so you're not seeing the ballet of the red shoes because you can't see the footwork all the time. Uh, I mean, it depends on the film. Maybe we would be less harsh. But that sort of example when someone says, oh, I, you know, I torrented it and the last scene was missing, but I more or less got it. That's how I saw the tree of life. Mm, mm, Big yeah. fan. You yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it keep coming back to Malik? It's not me doing this. <laughs> and you know, because it's like I want to go out on a limb because I know nothing about this guy. So I'm just like constantly trying to dance off the edge of the stage because I don't know <laughs> what I'm saying. Or like this guy, um, I feel all at sea, just uh, just as one should be. <laughs> not for long. <laughs> no, not for long. What if only I could read some excellent book? Oh, Pamela, you're, you're welcome back any time. <laughs> I'll have to write another book, though. That's the problem. <laughs> I'm sure that will be no problem. Well, you're, you're averaging one one every year and a half at the moment. <laughs> That's not quite true. Um, I'm working on something at the moment, which is a project that I'd like to propose, and I just I so believe in it, and I so think that no one's going to want to read about it. So um, I'm, I'm at that moment. I need to actually write the proposal. That's what write I need the, to do. Write the pitch. No, I'm, mm. uh, I'm I'm sure you'll 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 get it. I, I, you know, you've got you've got a great record so far. Put it that way. Oh, that's very kind of you. I uh, 
it's it's interesting um writing these bfa film classics which are such a fun thing to do and and mm. well i say fun this one had a very strict deadline it was in some mm. ways quite you know Stressful. despairing moments yeah, I, right, I had right. my i had my vicky page moments while re- oh, trying to work on this um but they're lovely and you get to sort of research this film and, and put together this kind of capsule book about what's great about it and what's interesting about it and what doesn't work what does and how it means and I thought I had quite a good response to Pandora's Box, which is the silent film I wrote before. You know, people were very nice. You invited me on your lovely podcast. When you write one on a talkie that not only have lots of people seen, but they love, love dearly, the response is so gratifying. I've been sat, you know, in my, you know, at my desk working on this, thinking, how can you possibly presume to write on such a masterpiece? And, you know, people are very delighted to have the book in their hand. Uh, so yeah, uh, I highly recommend writing about films that people actually have seen and like. It's a great experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I understand the trepidation, and I totally understand the uh, you know I, I understand the response to it, having read the book myself. Um, going back to Moira Shira in terms of uh, self criticism, uh, I love the part that you talk about how she was like, "Oh, I hate my spiky hand movements in that film." And, but the thing is, you know, as a writer, I'm sure you had this thing, you can't be a great ballerina. You mm. cannot be a great dancer. You can't be great at anything without noticing everything. When she talks about her spiky hand movements, I mean, I find it really hard to even see that because, I mean, she's very she's very slender. Exactly. Uh, I, was, you know? I was doing the same thing. I was doing the same thing when I was re-watching the film. I was going, what spiky hand movements? And the only thing I could see was when she's going into the church or trying to get into the church. But I thought that's totally to do with the character and the and the moment. That's not. I mean, you know, it's it's to do with her style of dancing, right? Which she learned and she believed in, you know, and also what was what was considered to be the best thing. So everyone. Uh, F1 is uh, very fond of Margot Fontaine. She is the lead, and this is very much defining Maura Shearer's career at the moment, is that she's always sort of second fiddle or third fiddle to Margot Fontaine, understandably. And Nanette de Valois is trying to do everything to amplify Margot Fontaine, and we love that for her. Margot Fontaine's great attribute was the grace, the changing from one shape to another as smoothly and elegantly, you almost don't notice it. And actually... Maura Shira's style is much more uh, sprightly and lively and quick. And she can, you know, you'll see sort of choppy leg movements, which are beautiful in their own way. But not only, you know, could she sometimes might want to work on her smoothness at this point in her career, you know, she gets better and better. But it's obviously the exact opposite of what is being praised and what is being held up as the ideal. You know, it's a bit like, saying that she's got red hair rather than brunette hair which you know at that time in ballet people would still be like here's a problem about your hair you know let's get you a hair net obviously in technicolor her red hair is the best thing about her you know not the best thing but you know it's the the attribute that everybody wants you know on stage she's covering it up in film she's she's enjoying it uh she's uh, looking great uh, as a sort of technicolor redhead and you know, it's about that comparison and it's about that hyper critical study, which you see perhaps in the sequence in the film when everyone is nervous. Because there's they don't have that moment of we've made a great ballet and that's all there is to it. They don't have that sense of triumph. They they are worried about the door and whether the score is correct and whether they're going to remember the music for their entrance. Because, you know. I think Powell felt like that about his films. One of the reasons why he always had to go on a hike afterwards, you know, oh, is it is it good enough? Is it right? And that's why the critics could sting him. You know? Right, right. I love I love that that moment of yeah, she doesn't understand, and the only one who's calm is Boris, and he's the one saying, "You'll re- when the music comes in, you'll be perfect." And he's calm, and he's the only one. He actually says in the box before the curtain goes, "We've all, you know." this is it for us, we've done it, you know, before it even begins. He's the only one with that preternatural uh, confidence. Let's talk a little bit about the fellows who are surrounding Vicky Page and and Moira, Moira uh, Shira in the film. Um, uh, you have Craster and and Boris as, as sort of like two potential sort of destinies. And it's also sort of this sort of parasitic maleness 
Um, you know, she's the dancer. She's the 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 person everybody is looking at. Uh, but these are the men who are sort of trying to be the Pygmalion style, uh, you know, Machiavellian uh, influencers. Even if Craster might be doing it via romantic love, he's also he comes on stage at one point as a potential lover, but also, you know, he's the conductor. Yeah, I mean, you know, Julian Kreister, it's really clever what Marius Goring does. You know, he introduces him as this comic figure, and then you get to see that he really is in love with uh, Victoria, even if it's a bit strange. He has that speech about, you know, telling a, a pretty young girl in the future that he was once in love with Victoria Page when she was unspoiled, which actually was a Victoria Page speech in the original screenplay. Um, but yeah, his conception of being married to Victoria Page is that she would be his muse. Um, perhaps that she would also dance, but not for Boris Lermontov, obviously, and so therefore not to the best of her ability. So the idea that he wants something from her, he wants to have this beautiful wife and this beautiful ballerina in his life and a muse, he doesn't want to be second fit. He doesn't want to support a great ballet dancer. And obviously B Boris Lermontov, who was offering her the career, it's always going to be the ballet Lermontov featuring Victoria Page. It's going to be on his terms. He's going to make all the money. You know, all these people... You know, when you see the chaps from the ballet company knocking on Boris Lermontov's door at night and saying, wasn't she marvellous tonight? I mean, you know, it's all money in the bank. You know, that's one really crude way to put it. They're, the fact that they have a great lead ballerina sells tickets, you know, and everyone is working this woman really hard. I mean, they're so brutal to her in rehearsal. They're not nice to her until after she's had her um, success on opening night, you know. And if she breaks her ankle or she gets married, or she, you know, does gets fat, they'll pop her out with someone else. They completely will go and grab someone else. And so, you know, she's on this in this very precarious position with these men who are ostensibly circling around her, making her look great, but they're really also kind of leeching off her. And it's it's quite scary. And of course, it's exactly what happens to young female film stars, you know, which is not an experience that Maura Shearer knew about at that point and probably wasn't quite how her career went. But, you know, that's exactly how it happens, you know. If you are if you are a Jennifer Lawrence or a Natalie Portman, you probably would have a lot of stories to tell. Absolutely, or a Judy Garland, who is the other yeah. wearer of the famous red shoes, which you point out, um, uh, which you point out at, at, at a uh, at an early point in the book. Um, That's probably like the most extreme example of it, but it's true. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. I mean, I've, I I was thinking of uh, last week's podcast, we did um, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, and it was a question I wanted to ask Nancy, but uh, I forgot. <laughs> so I, just ask me instead. Yeah, I'm going to ask you. Um, but Elizabeth Taylor, always uh, having read the book and talked to Nancy about it, strikes me as the anti-Judy Garland. She has exactly the same sort of career, but she's just much more capable. She's just, in terms of, she's much more... Um, able to re to resist and to impose her own authority um and that's not to lay any of the blame of what happened to judy garland at judy garland's door necessarily it's just to see that you know someone who's fragile that's that's what will the machine will do to you but there is another possibility if you you know if if you have superhuman skills like elizabeth taylor obviously did yeah, I mean, it's difficult. You know, what do you do if you are Maura Shearer? You know, she's in the Saddles Wells. She's obviously doing very well, but it's quite clear to her that Margot Fontaine is the prima ballerina. So she takes the opportunity to be in film. And I don't think that it's... I don't think she ever thinks that she's going to make her the grand career in film. And partly because it's really difficult for her. As soon as she has a success in The Red Shoes, oh, well, people in America are comparing her to Ginger Rogers. That's not good. She's getting more attention in America than the rest of her company. That's not good for her at work. And then even when she she dances a lead, you know, people say, well, that's only because Margot Fontaine was injured and didn't you jump into that quick? It's very difficult. All these difficult things. You know, a lot of the time, as a woman in that position, the only thing you can do is say, no, no, I'm not going to do this. And I think, you know, a lot of Paul and Pressburger films that found, fans have been a bit disappointed with the fact that Maura Shearer doesn't say, well, of course, I'm so terribly grateful to the Red Shoes you know, which launched me and made everyone see what a great dancer I am and made me a star. Because she's like, well, actually, it was really horrible for her. So many ways, so difficult. She, It wasn't the escape that she needed. She did make more films. Um, 
she even worked of course again with Michael Powell despite having had such a difficult time um but she didn't make anything she didn't do anything quite as great as the Red Shoes again so this thing that makes her great in one sphere doesn't make her great in the ballet world you know Valentine said to her I didn't think you could dance because I've seen the Red Shoes you know like so brutal um you know but as a happy person Maura Shearer if, I mean, I've read so much um, about her and read interviews with her. So phenomenally intelligent. She had four children. She had this long and happy and interesting marriage to an interesting person. Uh, people are throwing me all their red shoes anecdotes constantly. I tell you what, if you were walking in Scotland in the 70s, the 60s or 70s, walking your dog, she was walking her dog. You had a nice time. She was friendly to people. She wished she could have done more with her life. She could see she could be brilliant, effectively. And she wished she could have had more education, played more sports, ridden horses, you know, studied history. She didn't think that dancing well was enough for her. And I think, you know, with the kind of Judy Garland model, there's an idea that you're told at a young age that all your work is you have to do this and that's it. As long as you look like a little girl in Judy Garland's case and sing your heart out and you do what you're told it's going to be well for you Maura Shearer is the example of someone who perhaps you know always always say but why why can't I do this as well and maybe Elizabeth Taylor was a little bit like that too she sort of saw the broader world whatever opportunity she had and you know, she had the ability to see beyond being in National Velvet you know being the, the you know the bride <laughs> being this pretty little girl she knew she could do more I mean I'm no expert on Elizabeth Taylor but she's a great example of someone who took their fame and made interesting films and took their fame and made interesting work and did so much activism and you know at what point do you think you know my purpose on earth is to make more movies or my purpose on earth is to be this person who has this platform and say you know, I'm going to do something else with it. Maura Shira lectured on ballet history for the rest of her life. And I'm sure she was a brilliant speaker, you know, for, for, for that. I've never, you know, I don't have any transcripts of her lectures, but I'm sure she was excellent. Um, you know, and she didn't keep trying to make ballet films. Yeah, I mean, I, I, after you've made The Red Shoes, why would you? <laughs> you've kind of made it, haven't you? You've made the one. You don't need to <laughs> keep on repeating well, I mean, she might not. Have, I mean, she was much happier with the tales of Hoffman, with, which is obviously all ballet all the time for her. Uh, her yeah, and she she made lots of films that had ballet sections in, but they don't not a patch on, you know, because because they aren't. If if she'd have had her ideal scenario, she'd have made the ballet shoes a few years later when she was better at dancing. She's so specific with her criticism of herself. She's like, I was better a few years later, better in Hoffman because she just developed as an artist, and better because they let her dance. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, you said something just then about how, you know, cinephiles don't, you know, especially Pal Pressburger fans don't, you know, resent Moira Shearer being a little bit negative about the production. I think that's kind of in, a, in an interesting, it's an interesting sort of irony that you can watch something like the uh, Red Shoes, which is all about the dirty, cold rehearsal rooms and the grimy backstage and the bitterness and the bitching and all the rest of it. And the cutthroat sort of, you know, the bit where Boris just dismisses five of the women and see, maybe see you next year, you know, uh, after, thank you for all your work, maybe see you next year. And it's just heartbreaking, that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can watch that and then think, but obviously great films are made in a paradise of collegial good humour and and it's glamorous and everybody's... Yeah, surely you can't you see that the filmmakers themselves are talking about filmmaking. They're talking about the production of all art. It's all coming out of, you know, Shaun of the Dead, which is one of the jolliest, lightest British comedies, was an absolute nightmare to make. You know, Edgar Wright hated making that film. And Don't know um, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, um, uh, he he was a complete sort of perfectionist, and he had everything screen, you know, and he just didn't it from you know, he was working you know the usual sort of incredibly long hours, and and you know, Simon Pegg and people said, oh, he hated, he was just having such a hard time making the film, and you watch the film and you think this was made by a bunch of mates, yeah. you know, just having a laugh, and it's like nope, it wasn't. It was absolutely clocked to the second and meticulous and all the rest of it so much hard work involved in in making that film well this is also a zombie film so i mean it's clearly you know the same thing. <laughs> it really really is and 
And it shows you that competitiveness between the composer, the choreographer, between all the dancers who want a solo, between, you know, the set designer wants his beautiful set design to be at the front. It's like, no, you've got to move out of the way so we can see the dancers. And, you know, even if you look carefully at Robert Heltman's performance in the ballet, what he's doing, what he's doing, the great Robert Heltman, he just, just jumped off stage from doing Hamlet, great choreographer and ballet dancer he's doing very minimal work he's doing partnering he's showing off uh, Morishira constantly this film shows you the competitiveness and the difficulty and it was even worse on set you know um, Michael Powell was horrendous to Albert Masterman and Albert Masterman's wife which is sort of crazy so much so that Anton Warbrook walked off and said I'm never going to work with you again of course he did but you know it was quite brutal this is not a happy time necessarily i think it was a time of highs and lows i don't know what how edgar wright would feel uh about his but you know i think there was an awful lot of it was so difficult and painful in the making and then they would look at the rushes for the ballet sequence at night the whole crew and probably say well actually actually it came out really well but it's it's gutting and it's grueling and for morishiro it was her first experience for you know almost everyone involved they been through the war they you know they've been sent here there and everywhere they they were going on a limb to make this film they were working seven days a week it wasn't a fun time for anyone and there's a lot that got cut from the film that would have been filmed you know and and when it didn't get the response in britain that they wanted when the executives took one look at it and said no we're not giving this a premiere you know it's a long road. It's a long road to the word of mouth success. Even the critical reviews that are very positive in Britain are very concerned with other things. Is it really like ballet? Dillis Powell uses her positive review of Red Shoes to talk about some interesting aspects of British film funding that she really thinks should be addressed. You know, it's not this wow moment that you would want. You have to wait till it comes out in America for that. And how long does the artistic ego need to bounce back to go, well, I'd go and make a film with him again because in the end it was okay. <laughs> of course, you had the opposite with Hoffman where no one liked that really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I mean, I, 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 think that's, I think that's a relevant point. I think the, the you know, I, I just think it's, it's interesting how some very, um, I don't want to talk too much out of school, but some very revered sort of critical voices um, don't seem to understand and 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 the sort of cinephiles in general don't seem to understand what it actually looks like from the inside you know and just as the audience in the gods can be concentrating on the art purely um you know the and and this is by no means to give you know obnoxious directors and producers any license to behave abhorrently to other people but you have to understand how that how the pressures that everyone is under are incredible. Yeah, and I think that some people do get to that point. I think your first look, the critic's first look at the film is, is it like ballet? Is ballet really like this? Does this feel like going to the West End? Does it feel like what I know of people who work in the theatre? And they're obviously very, very upset by the ending. And so, for example, if you read, I am quite obsessed with C.A. Lejeune, if you read her Observer review, she's very positive, really. She has this, she says, lop, you know, she says, make one cut and make the film better. She's very anti the ending. And she sort of hovers around whether or not it's like ballet. She was an opera fan. She is a perfectionist and worked too hard. She reviews the film several places. She reviews it in the sketch as well. And I love her review there. Maybe she's had long to think about it, but she says, you don't need to know, and I'm going to mispronounce two French words in a row. So enjoy this. You don't need to know an entrecote from an entrechat to, to understand that this has the authentic thrill. At this point, she realises that she what she, she understands what The Red Shoes is about. She, she's worked in newspapers her whole life. You know, she understands that the difficulties and the joy of collective endeavour, and that's what it's about. And if you are someone who's worked in the newspaper, for example, uh, you, or, you know, she worked on lots of creative endeavours, you understand that's what it is. This is what it's about. It's about the difficult birthing of the art and what you do afterwards. I've got a neighbour who's a ballerina or former ballerina and uh, she told me that she quite liked the film. She knew lots of people hated it. The most authentic thing for her was the fact that the morning after Vicky Page's great success, she toddles off to bar class just as if nothing had happened. And, you know, this is the kind of 
feeling that people recognize that actually things aren't all about the stardom they're all about the hard work and that sort of pitting the put in the stomach feeling that you're just still an ordinary person despite the fact that you're on stage in Monte Carlo but yeah I think and, and the detail of that scene yeah. so sorry to interrupt Pamela oh, yeah. but just yeah. the detail of that scene where she she's the first to come in so you think she's made a special effort to be the first to come in to show that her head isn't swollen and then the dance instructor says anything swollen i mean your head of course so everybody's getting her like pretty and even when she toddles into the room it's like she's um it's like one of those wonderful uh uh shots where you think it's a matte painting but it's actually a mirror so yeah. you're, you're seeing her approach from two different angles and there's a little bit that she just adjusts the buttock of her um of her uh, tutu of her uh leotard yeah leotard and it's just like oh that's getting up that's riding up a little bit and it's just it's just like so this is a human being this is not the the goddess who was dancing last night this is somebody yeah. with buttocks <laughs> and, uh... and what do we know about victoria page we know that she's just had this incredible success we know that she's actually dripping in cash, right? This woman is rich and she's wearing ripped tights in that thing. Imagine getting up the morning after. Well, I mean, they're just her tights, her practice tights. And you don't, she really doesn't want anyone to think that she's being grand. She does have the most beautiful green and gold wrap that she puts on afterwards. So, you know, we know we're back in um, Victoria Page territory. But yeah, I mean, that walk into the bar class, it's a beautiful shot. It's as, intimi as intimidating and grand as, say, the rehearsal room at the Par Paris Opera except it's just the bar class and that's the tyranny i mean they talk about it later in the film if you're a if you're serious about ballet even if you're not performing even if you're not rehearsing you're going to class every day it's not to say you're practicing you're going to the bar and someone is shouting at you about your deportment and putting you through moves it's not you alone in the gym just flexing your toes it's about going back to school every day which is very humbling for people uh you know who might have that autistic uh, artistic ego? I love the fact as well that Vicky comes from wealth because uh, that's such. A, it would be such an obvious thing to make her into, as you said, a Cockney girl. I never, I didn't understand this reference. You said something about who had had multiple multiple tonsillectomies. What does well, that? A joke in the, there's a joke in the original screenplay which I refer to where they talk about a friend who's had her tonsils out several times, meaning that she's had very several very small operations. Which is to say, I, I well, I can't imagine why a person would. So yeah, that that's referred to earlier in the book. And then you say, yeah, she could, she could have been Vicky Page if you were doing the classic British ballet film. The the young girl who becomes a ballerina is normally this cockney working class girl who meets an upper class man. You know, Svengali so, Star is Born sort of. Or just, yeah. or just you know, might get a posh boyfriend, but then of course, can they really be together because she's just a little musical ballet dancer? Whereas Victoria Page doesn't have to be beholden to anybody. She is entirely, you know, she has her position in society. She has her talent. You know, if the if the Boris Lermontov didn't take her, she had a place in another ballet company, uh, which we see at the Mercury Theatre. She would have got another. She doesn't need, you know, she isn't waiting to be discovered. She might be waiting for greatness, but she's not waiting to make a living to be known to have an exciting life she's been to monaco several times before and she stayed in that posh hotel where they stay because they're the principals she lives that life there's a there's a scene which everybody loves where she goes to meet boris lermitoff and she's wearing a ball gown because she thinks they're going on a date and she climbs up the stairs and then she realizes it's just a meeting and a lot of people say well it's so embarrassing for her because she's overdressed and she has to lie and say she's going to dinner um but actually Victoria Page looks perfect in the ball, ball gown. She doesn't look embarrassed at all. Yeah, yeah. It's not like Julia Roberts turning up in a Gucci gown and, you know, not, not being able to carry it off. It's, <laughs> this is what she does. I mean, there's that scene as well outside the theatre where she, she meets uh, Boris and he snubs her as he gets into the Rolls Royce. But the person he's going off with is like, you're coming with us, Vicky. You know, she, he, he knows her. It's not, um, she, could, she could make it embarrassing for Boris if she wanted to. And um, why does that friend of hers think that she's in Covent Garden? He says, are you shopping or are you slumming? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. that's her, like, trying to get her dream career. Are you slumming? You know? Yeah, yeah. For, for people around her, this is a peccadillo. It's not uh, It's not like something they would particularly admire, you yeah. know. 
No, I mean, so she's got, she's got, uh, she is her own person. I mean, she's that dream movie character that doesn't mm. need to do anything except focus on the task at hand of being a great ballerina. She mm. doesn't have to go to work every day or feed her kids or anything like that. We don't want that. It's too boring in films. So Matt, have to Matt have Hooper, realized. Matt Hooper in um, Jaws. There's a brilliant line <laughs> in that where. Um, Chief, Bro- they're out looking for a boat, and Chief Brody says, "Oh, is this all the institutes?" He says, "No, mostly it's mine." He goes, "What? What are you rich or something?" And he goes, "Yep." Yeah, and that, that's what and you want. That's that's it. It's just I love that line because it just tells you everything you need to know. This guy's an obsessive, and he's got loads of money. You know, it's not. Um, <laughs> he doesn't have to be out here looking at sharks because it's his job. You know, he's a spoilt rich guy. Yeah, um, you don't want him to have to leave and do a, sh- a shift in the supermarket. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, like when people were sort of worried when they saw how rich the Phoebe Waller Bridge character in Fleabag was, it's like, well, yeah, I want her to go around having inappropriate love affairs. I don't want her to have to work. She can open the cafe. I just don't know. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, in real life, that's not speaking to me, unfortunately. But in, in art, I'm like, please have a nice big room so that I can get, so they can get the cameras in. And please don't have to work for a living. Because if you nip off to Tesco for the overnight stacking shift, that's really going to put a crimp in this narrative. <laughs> I think, I think, I, I know what you mean. And I think, it, it, I think, it, but I, I also like the opposite when it's done really well, where oh, you, yeah, of course. where there's like, I, there's a bit in Silver linings playbook where bradley cooper is rushing out of a of a diner uh which he's just ordered oatmeal and he's rushing out of a diner to follow jennifer lawrence and the waitress stops him and says hey mr oatmeal your bill (laughs) and and it's just like that wouldn't usually happen in a movie because it would be like you know nobody pays for anything everybody finds a parking space immediately so (laughs) i'd like to ask Sorry, yeah, go that's ahead, Vicky Page is the kind of woman who always finds a parking space because she's got a chauffeur driven Rolls Royce, which is <laughs> ideal. There you go. Why was this such a big success in America compared to to Britain? What was the the thing that you that sort of the Americans saw and 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 not only loved but wanted to imitate and wanted to see much more of? Well, I think um, the marketing film was quite shameless on the legs front. I'll be right. honest, um, right. but. Uh, that that was not responsible for the success. I think the American audiences recognised what they considered an American art form, the musical, and I know it isn't a musical, but it has so much of that, and they saw it done really, really well. And it might not seem like a compliment to you and I, but they were like, wow, she's like Ginger Rogers. You know, mm. this is like Ginger Rogers. I mean, she's beautiful. I mean, Maura Shira couldn't, I mean, she couldn't walk down the street without someone pointing out. It was distracting. It was a thing. She was known as the extremely beautiful Moira Shira. So, you know, obviously that worked well in the movies. But the scale of it and the style of film it is, it was it was speaking to the people that loved a backstage musical who liked a spectacular, who realised that film could be big. They didn't have any hang-ups about whether this was an actual a rendition of say a touring theatre company and they certainly didn't have any hang-ups about the fact that people were rich they didn't feel embarrassed about it at all um so obviously in britain it comes out and there's rationing and we have boris lermatov eating the most elaborate breakfast you've ever seen um digging and, you know, in on his second grapefruit yeah and with so much sugar and she's putting glucose in our orange juice for god's God sake you know and the beautiful clothes and things like this and it's very possible to be living and you know when i was sort of joking about i don't want to see films about people who have to work obviously i do but it's got a narrative bonus here if you are in austere post-war britain you can enjoy the red shoes as a fantasy or you can feel perhaps a bit uncomfortable about it and that's partly why the critics didn't know where to put themselves they they could see it was great but they have these kind of caveats but in america they just thought this is a great show you know this is spectacular and perhaps enjoy the fact that it was slightly different to the variety of spectacular film that they had in America. I, uh, uh, the marketing in America was not, have you seen the red shoes? It was how many times have you seen the red shoes? And again, I tell you the, the year and a half I spent working on this, you know, people kept telling me my father saw that film five times. My father saw that film seven times, uh, you know, that they went back and back and bought, misses on a date and so forth you know people wanted to see it again and again and again so you can explain it i think by saying that they recognize this this sort of take on their great cinematic art form but it also just had a magic thing obviously just had that thing that connects with people you know when you think about breakout film successes 
like this year we had Barbie, you can sit there and say, well, it's pre-sold and it's quite charming and it's quite intelligent and it's got a great aesthetic, but there's also something. It's just mm-hmm. something that is cutting through that you couldn't necessarily replicate. And they didn't, did they, replicate right. it right. Um, in America? You know? Um, and, you know, good on the Americans. I mean, yeah. maybe it was just so many tickets sold because Gene Kelly was going there studying it every night. <laughs> <laughs> Gene Kelly was 60% of the uh, the box office. But, I mean, yeah, I <laughs> one of the other things that I, again, re-watching it and also sort of considering it in the context of Pal and Pressburger, um, there's something about their movies that although they're, and I know there's a BFI season you've been involved mm-hmm. with recently uh, and is ongoing, um, but there's this... When I'm watching them, then they're not British films in the sense that they're not sort of recognizably they're they're Britain as Europe films. They're films which which I think post Brexit actually call us back to a time and certain individuals. Christopher Isherwood comes to mind, W. H. Auden, who very much feel themselves as British as Europeans, you know, not as there's Britain versus Europe or Britain against Europe. And that's possibly Pressburger's influence as well. But but also Powell in the south of France, he's comfortable being somewhere else. He's comfortable with a scene in which one of the main characters is speaking French on the telephone, you know. Yeah. Um, there's there's not a sense of he's sinister because he speaks foreign lingo and we don't get it. And maybe that's also something that the Americans were much more comfortable with watching this as a European art film in in English. Yeah, I mean, it, it's strange. You know, Emmett Pressburger obviously had lived in several different countries uh, before he, you know, and worked in different film industries before he came to Britain. But, you know, the story about him is always that he was more British than the British. He loved it. Biggest Arsenal fan you'd ever find, you know, absolutely crazy about oh, Britain. Well, you, you can't be perfect. And look, do you know what? Some of us are married to Arsenal fans. Oh dear. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> we all have our cross to bear, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, and yet, you know, considered an enemy alien during the war, didn't have a radio. All the time he's making the greatest, you know, mass consumption broadcast uh, entertainment that the country can never see. He's got not even allowed a radio, which mm. is insane for someone who loved music and so forth. Um. And then, as you say, Michael Powell, cosmopolitan, yet a man of tent. And so they have a way of filming England as if it's a foreign country. Look at Much Wenlock in Gone to Earth. You know, he was looking at, look, it's a place steeped in in pagan rituals. Look at Scotland in I Know Where I'm Going. I mean, they're both obsessed with Scotland, particularly Michael Powell, of going to the most remote part and seeing quite how far it is from Manchester. You know, Mm. that's the simplest way to explain the plot of I Know Where I'm Going, but, you know... Shetlands is quite far from Manchester in every single possible. Oh, no, um, my dad used to work in the Shetlands. He worked hey, at you... Sullum Vaux. <laughs> you know, the Hebrides, yeah. I think, actually, I'm talking about. Sorry, not the Shetlands. Ah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, the yeah, sh- point is, I always get that wrong. Um, yeah. But, you know, the edge of the world is right. obviously set in one of these remote sketch, um, Scottish islands, and that title alone tells you how they feel about it. Um, so it's a way of seeing everything in both directions at once, and that's partly the joy of collaboration. I think it's really important to, when you think about the Red Shoes, this cross-continental artistic collaboration, the Russians and the French and so forth and the English, this is all post-war. It's made in 1947. It's only released in 48, but made in 1947. There are a lot of wounds here that Mm. are really raw. And when you've got horror in that context, a lot of people are still trying to process all the horrors they've learned about post-war. The horror of war is one thing. The horror that emerged after the war when people found out the extent of what was happening in Europe, you know, and that in a way is what gives the film its power, but it, it does make it very difficult sometimes to think about it. And that's what makes the lack of subtitles very audacious. You don't ever need to know really what they're saying. If you if you have a couple of words of French, you've got it, you're fine. Mm-hmm. You know, enough is translated. But it's about putting people in that space where someone's going to talk foreign language around them. And how that feels to an audience in 1948 is a really raw and volatile thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, and then, you know, Paul and Pressburger, after this, they have a few more films uh, to go through. Uh, they, they get into... To go through, yeah, to, to find their way. <laughs> Where would... Oh, the river plate is coming up. I'll just I'll knock that one out the way. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, it's one of those, you know, it always feels like a filmic sort of what if the Beatles had recorded another album, which apparently we, we, we keep, that there's an end. I can't believe the Rolling Stones recorded a new album and then the Beatles knock them off with it. They must be like, Mick Jagger must be fuming. I mean, you're from the same part of the world as me. You know that there will always be more Beatles content and there'll always be one more person that was like, oh, yeah, I was in the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. like six days. Um, yeah, actually, I inspired the lyrics to blah, blah, you know. <laughs> the Beatles will never, ever die. Yellow submarines about my nan. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations. Um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Um, the thing about the Harlem Pressburger is this, all the films have value. All the films are really interesting. The Powell film, the Pressburger film, all of them. Um, there is this run. And when you talk about the vertiginous quality of the red shoes, you run, run, run. Oh, you're right up in the gods and you have to fall. I mean, in many ways, that is what happened. They got right to the climax of everything that they could do. Whether or not you believe that the red shoes is the best film they ever made, which I am not here to argue at all, it's got so much of everything that I wanted to put in a film and it's worked so well and was such a great success. And then nothing else quite hits back that mark after that, much as I love some of those subsequent later films. And so it does have this feeling, this sort of bottleneck feeling that you, it's the crescendo, isn't it? We are the, the war films, that sort of six films are like the crescendo building up to the red shoes and then interesting films. And if they'd have had that height of their powers moment when it wasn't the war, when the critics weren't so concerned about whether or not this was what we wanted, when they didn't get constrained by budgets, when they didn't have to make films about war or wartime themes, which are obviously very powerful, but not necessarily what you you you, you want to do. Um, who knows what they could have made? Um, and, and we all know, not all know, but I think a lot of people know that Michael Powell kept trying every day to make more films mm. um, you know so it wasn't for want of ideas yeah i mean that's the story of the british film industry generally <laughs> brilliant people making a, a good run of four or five movies if not more and then spending the rest of their careers trying to get money enough to i mean i think of nicholas rogue in this context yeah. um, you know he made uh, amazing films from 1970 to 19 what would 19 early 80s really yeah, yeah. and then after that it was kind of this is the odd film that pops up but he's he's much it's like a jobbing director by that point yeah and i think i mean one book i i mean obviously you can tell from the quotations i uh i enjoyed reading michael powell's memoirs but one book I'd really uh, urge people to read because it's beautifully written, it's a great book, is the biography of Emmerich Pressburger by one of his grandsons. And um, he says in that book, he says writing about Emmerich Pressburger is a bit like doing women's film history because you want to keep pointing out that he achieved this and he did this and this was his idea. But of course, he's always going to be overshadowed by this person that he worked with because Michael Powell was the kind of character and had so much talent that people will say, oh, this was all Powell, this was all Powell. And you have to sometimes say, oh, no, some of this was Pressburger. And, you know, I found that quite um, a wise comment in the story of it. It's not it's not trying to take away from Powell. It's just saying you have to sometimes stick up for Pressburger. And a similar thing, you know, just because someone only wrote successfully, you know, uh, Pressburger's directorial efforts are not very well regarded, or just because people only made films up to this point that were very successful, doesn't mean those aren't valuable. And that's another women's film history thing, or as you say, a British film history thing. You know, just because the career wasn't long, just because they didn't hitchcock it up and keep making, making, making films that were so successful until they, they died, doesn't mean that those things don't have value. You know, I've been working on this, and I've got like a to-do list of talks I have to do and this that and the other I can sometimes be a bit like oh yeah Paul and Pressburger postage and packing in my house you know postage and packing I've got this to-do list and then I just stop and watch one of the films you know because you have to for work or you know I'm watching a clip and I get stopped in my tracks and you know if they had only ever made I know where I'm going I'd still want to be on this podcast talking about them you know if they'd only ever made a matter of life and death they'd be world beaters absolutely and the red shoes and its success is the, you know, it is the thing they are most well known for globally. And it's such a fascinating film. It's why it was such an honor to write about it, because you get mm. to take this thing that everybody knows about 
and dive into what makes it so weird. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think Powell and Pressburger, I was thinking about Ridley Scott the other day and thinking how, um, aside from Alien and Blade Runner, I think those two films are masterpieces. And if he's only made them, that's great. And then and then there's a lot, there's quite a big drop off to his next good film. Um, he's. I don't think he's like a Kubrick. I don't think he's like a Scorsese where I find it difficult to rank him. You know, because mm. cause those those filmmakers, any film that I'm watching at the time seems to be my favorite film. Yeah. And I, I would and I would say the same thing's true of Pal and Pressburger, that, that the film that I'm currently watching is my favorite Pal and Pressburger film um, or the Coen brothers, for that matter. Or, you know, there are mm. lots of filmmakers who would beat Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, obviously, would yeah, be yeah, yeah. would be too definite um, that they, they are they are producers of masterpieces. And, and those magical moments that mm. they understood that cinema can be in these moments mm. that are so sublime that, you know, if you're in the cinema, you want to rewind it. You yeah. know, I had this very strange experience when I was working on this book. Um, I was having a lot of work done in this house. And uh, I think I spoke to you during that time when I was sort of shoehorned into a cupboard um, uh, while I was working. And I was working downstairs. And to make an obvious reference to compose cinema, I had to rewatch on my laptop on the dining table, uh, the ending of Black Narcissus. Not how Paul and Pressburger envisaged you watching it, particularly not with a chap walking in every five minutes to say things about the how the lock on the back door had become warped or, you know, what did I want to do about the windowsill? You know, and I mean, I'm very lucky to be in that position that nice people were uh, coming around to make the house watertight. So I was very lucky. Every single time I press play again, I was instantly in that captivated moment. Like I've never had such a strong reaction to watching a, a clip when you know you and I we will rewatch a clip for various reasons. Watching that sequence, sniff, snapping out of it and into it, I didn't care about my walked back door. I didn't care about it when I was talking about it. I certainly didn't care about it when I was watching Black Narcissus on my laptop. And you know, subsequently to that, I saw Black Narcissus in the Grand Piazza of Bologna. Uh, you know the new print that they they had and it was a transcendent experience in every way and I thought you know still pretty good even on a laptop in like 30 second increments how do they do that mm. it's beauty mm. I guess yeah yes and 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 what you said right at the beginning of our conversation the breadth of the humanity as well that you can have these moments of transcendent beauty but you can also have the bar school the morning after and the and the too tight leotard or the or the you know the 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 way uh vicky page walks through covent garden and a, a guy turns around and goes what a corker <laughs> yeah. and it's just no. that and just that sort of like you know life yeah i mean they were all about this breadth of humanity they're all about the wider universe absolutely the widest possible conception of the universe of europe of britain of heaven and earth of the supernatural, the realms of magic, mysticism and, and everything that comes into everything. And they do the hard thing, which they make you care about awful people. Uh, I've just finished reading Emmerich Pressburger's masterful novel, The Glass Pearls, which I, if you haven't read it, John, I highly recommend you would love it. It's 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 written from the point of view of a chap who was a, a doctor doing experiments in the Nazi camps. Like it's You don't want to be in his brain, and yet you find yourself sympathising with his journey his uh attempts to evade justice in fact so you know this difficult leap that we feel bad for boris lermontov when he seems to almost die in the box at the end of the film that we are invested in the at the basis level uh the, the activities of these what seem like incredibly overprivileged egotistical artists on the south of france when the whole world has got bigger fish to fry you know it it speaks to what they can do with art, they can make you care. They can bring you into other realms, completely other realms. Nowhere near my life experience in this film. I'm so sorry to tell you, in case you thought that I was maybe summering in the south of France, and uh, you know I wore tiaras to tea. Um, but but I, I've always loved it, and people always do love this film, and it makes them want to become ballerinas, which is the definition of insanity. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so I'm going to take two. You've you've recommended two books already, so I'm going to take them as your recommended books. Emmerich Pressburger's um, biography. What's the title yeah. of that? Um, I think it's called um, the The Life of a Screenwriter. I can't ah, remember. Right. Let me just. I'm just going to grab it. Okay. I'll 
of course, the title is more clever than that. It's Emmerich Pressburger, The Life and Death of a Screenwriter by Kevin MacDonald. Forward, just by Billy Wilder. No oh, big deal. Uh, no big deal. No big deal. <laughs> no, no big deal. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's a great recommendation. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and the other the novel uh, by again by Emmerich Pressburger. Yeah, it's called The Glass Pearls, but. If I've done two Pressburger, I could recommend another book that I found really sure. useful to read. And I read it after my manuscript was submitted, Final Galley. Could nothing from here could go in, although I do slightly refer to it, which is um, Monsters by Claire Dederer, which is how do you sort of cope with the art art made by terrible people, which is in many ways the theme of The Red Shoes. It's a difficult read and you won't always agree with her, I think, but... Uh, a really fascinating subject to dig into. Right, right. No, that is that. That sounds great. That's I'm going to put that on the top of my list. Yeah, I, I remember a reference to it in the book. Actually, yes. So, mm. and I, I thought it was intriguing at the time. Um, yeah, so yeah. uh, she wrote an article, which I refer to the article, but the book didn't come out until afterwards. Uh, uh, and and in a way, the article was was more on the topic that I needed. But very interesting as a film fan, if you've ever caught yourself admiring a Chinatown. <laughs> Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 I get you. I I understand. We. I may have admired a Chinatown in my life. Oh, I, but hey, don't, Jake. That's tiny Chinatown. That's that's my Chinatown. <laughs> Our entire book is Chinatown. Believe me. Right. Oh my God. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. There's a uh, there's there's rich pickings for 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 a conversation there. Um, yeah. Listen, Pamela, thanks so much for uh, coming on the uh, podcast again. I had a brilliant time reading the book, a brilliant time revisiting Red Shoes and a brilliant time talking to you. Oh, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you and I'm so glad you enjoyed it. You know, I mean, I expect to see you at the bar. (laughs) B-A-double-R-E. Tomorrow morning. Yes, tomorrow morning. (laughs) With my my tight-fitting leotard. You you wear it well, John. (laughs) 